Okay, let's review about the cardiovascular system and the conduction system, at least what we went over yesterday. <clears throat> we have the three components that make up the cardiovascular system. I add the extra one only because it's part of the conduction system. So we have the pump, vessels, and fluid, and together they try to maintain the cardiac output. But without that conduction system and the automaticity for the uh, heart to generate an impulse and then for it to contract, after being stimulated so that we have the ejection of that stroke volume, that initial blood being pumped out through the left ventricle and out to the body. It's important to remember we have to have all of these working together. I guess some would say that they are still considered part of the pump, but the electrical conduction system is special. <coughs> and that if this fails, then they're putting in things like an external pacemaker or an internal pacemaker, or we'd be applying an external pacemaker onto the patient. Or they would implant an implantable, uh, automatic implantable defibrillator, or we'll be placing pads on them to defibrillate them. So to maintain the cardiac output, it requires that the heart rate is stable and that we have a, a good stroke volume that's coming out of the left ventricle. <coughs> if we are able and not capable of maintaining the cardiac output, then blood pressure is gonna drop. You see the patient become pale, cool, diaphoretic. They may feel weak. They may have this sense of impending doom, heart rate goes up, uh, respirations go up, everything's going up. <clears throat> but they're, they're developing hypotension. So the way that we determine in the field setting and our level of training when our cardiac output is inadequate is when basically they start to show signs of the sympathetic nervous system kicking in, tachycardia, pale cool, and diaphragmatic skin signs. And then you might see that there's some changes in their mental status. Hypotension should significantly indicate that the cardiac output is not being able to be maintained itself. <clears throat> not only does the heart rate increase through the stimulation of beta receptors, we also have the adrenaline and noradrenaline and norepinephrine, and these catecholamines, they secrete into the bloodstream these proteins, beta and alpha proteins that attach to these receptor sites that cause increased heart rate as well as uh, vasoconstriction. We also learned that in order to maintain the cardiac output of uh, blood circulating throughout the body, there's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The kidneys here, they have blood supply to them right off the aorta. And when the blood supply to them is inadequate or diminishes slightly, they can sense this with receptors, pressure receptors. They secrete a chemical or a protein called renin. This does really nothing, it's just a messenger that when it's in the lungs, is converted into angiotensin. Angiotensin. Angiotensin is a protein vasoconstrictor. We have a lot of vasoconstricting going on. We also have stimulation of aldosterone. Aldosterone also secrete, uh, secreted into the bloodstream, allows the kidneys then to hold back the release of sodium holds back the release of sodium. And when sodium is retained, water is also drawn back into the, the body or bloodstream. At the posterior pituitary, we have secretion of what's called antidiuretic hormone, ADH, or in some cases, people call this vasopressin. This will stimulate thirst as well as the retention of water. So the kidneys no longer produce urine because, well, it's being held back. It's being uh, inhibited by antidiuretic hormone. Now we went over then to the cardiac uh, conduction system and we said that the SA node is the general pacemaker side of the heart. It then it stimulates an impulse and there's an all or nothing situation where we have stimulation, the impulse continues down and we have immediate depolarization. We depolarize all of the intraatrial pathways. There is a slight hold up right at the AV node to allow the atria to empty. Once that impulse then passes through the AV node, it goes into the junction where all of these ventricular wires sort of bundle together. That's why they call this the bundle of his. The electrical impulse continues down through the right and left bundle branches. The left side having two bundle branches and the right having only one. As this is the larger, more muscular part of your cardiovascular system, as that impulse goes down those bundle branches, then they enter into the Purkinje system. Now a backup pacemaker site other than the SA node would be the junction AV node, and then somewhere down in the ventricles, really, really late, bad effects, 
poor generator if it's generating from the, the ventricles. What we learned though is that the normal rhythm, if it's generated from the SA node, will give us some easy characteristics to recognize what is a normal EKG. Sinus, because it's coming from the sinus atrial node, will give us a P wave, a PRI interval, the QRS complex, and a T wave, which will signify different things. When we see the P wave, the P wave is usually upright. This signifies that the atria have contracted because they were depolarized. The PRI interval, or PRI, or PR interval, signifies that slowing of conduction through the AV node here. This allows that atria to then empty into the ventricles. Now it's only held there for a very short millisecond. This is exaggerated here. Exaggerated. Once that impulse now is set free from the AV node, it continues down through the ventricles, the right and left bundle branches, and creates a QRS complex. The QRS complex signifies the depolarization and contraction of the ventricles. Once this is done, then we have a T wave, which represents repolarization of the entire conduction system. To final, uh, final, uh, uh, um, to recap the sinus rates, then if we see a P QRS T for every complex that's on the screen that we're seeing, all we need to now know is what rate this is. Between 60 and 100, we would consider that normal. If it's less than 60, 59, 58, 40, 30, 20, as long as it has a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave, where everything looks exactly the same, it's called sinus bradycardia. And then if the heart rate is now over 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, and there's a P wave in front of every QRS, and every QRS has a uh, T wave that's after that, and they all look alike, then that would be sinus tachycardia. I told you that there are some differences between sinus bradycardia and sinus tachycardia, it's not just the rate, but what might be causing it. So we talked about that fear, anxiety, temperature, pain can increase the heart rate causing tachycardia. Other things that may be bring down the heart rate, the bradycardia patient or bradycardia, might be medications such as beta blockers. And we know that the system is stimulated through a beta receptor site, beta one. So when somebody's taking a beta blocker, it may cause the slowing down of the heart rate and it may be bradycardia. Let's just review and think back to a patient that might be on this beta blocker medication if they were unable to maintain their blood pressure and cardiac output and they were on a beta blocker and their heart rate is bradycardic, then they're no longer able to maintain their cardiac output because their heart rate can't increase because of the blood loss. But they're taking that beta blocker that blunts that stimulation so that heart rate can't go up. All right.